Um, so uh, I'm Chad Maston, and thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. Um, so I'm coming to you not as an agile theorist or as someone who's written a book or a consultant, but rather a software engineer who became a CTO, who ran several companies um, into the ground, a couple of them, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then sort of saw the light. And um, I uh, am one of the few people that is going to admit to you that um, agile can be done wrong. It can be done very poorly, um, and it's very easy to fall into these traps that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I think there's a way out of them. Um, so first things first, I want to just sort of get a sense of who everybody is. Uh, how many people here are developers or engineers? A couple? Okay. Three or four. How many people are like product owners, PDMs, product managers, things like that? So most most yes, sort of like that. How many people are stakeholders? How many people are people that own the business end? Okay, a few over here. How many people like pizza? And that's why you're here. Okay. Um, so I got to say over here. You know, so so it's not engineer heavy heavy, which is totally fine. Um, so let's talk about what Agile is, because this comes up all the time. And uh, I just moved from Control Group, which I'm going to talk about a lot. It's an amazing company who literally just absolutely nails Agile development on every level. Um, and I moved to another company. And when I moved to my other company, uh, my new boss said to me, he said, so tell me, this Agile thing, it's just bullshit, right? It's just winging it. And I said, yeah. That's, yeah, it is. It's absolutely right. You know, because that's all his experience has been up to this point, is, is people telling him that Agile is fundamentally about you have to be able to adapt, you have to be able to move, you have to be able to respond to a change. So let's start with what is Agile. Is Agile a science or a religion? Is it either? Well, I don't think it's a religion, but consider that I am about to testify before you about Agile. Right? And that's and consider that when Agile, this word was created and used, it was all these guys getting together in the mountains in this mythical way, like to come down with these dictates of like scrum and lean and common. We can all find these common terms. So I do believe that there's a mythology around Agile. And and how about this if there's 12 principles of Agile? Like that number is doesn't have significance, right? Of course it does. Um, so there is this religious aspect of Agile itself. So let's start with that, with the religion. Let's start with the Old Testament. What are the four principles of Agile? You can't answer. Somebody, let's throw the frame on the board. Do, you, do we know what it is? Does anyone? Yes. Working code over documentation. OK, that's a good one. Working code over docs. Anyone else? Know any of them? Collaboration. That's right. So client collaboration over contract negotiation. Two more. <laughs> That's right. So individuals and interactions, but people who works <laughs> uh, Individuals and interactions over process and tools, and anything else? Responding to change directives. There we go. That's the one that, that gets everybody in trouble. Respond to change over following a plan. Now, let me suggest something to you. That unless you actually know these and can recite them, that you don't really have a lot of claim a validity to claim that you're an agile developer or product manager or stakeholder. You have to memorize this. It's, these are four things. And it, there's an easy way to remember it, which is individuals working with clients to respond to change. Right? There's a little mnemonic for you. So learn them. Just go home and practice it. And then start using it. Because here's one thing I figured out about these four things. It's an equation. It's an equation that helps you solve problems that come up. So for instance, a developer uh, was, was having a problem with a QA guy in one of the jobs I was working on. And the QA guy came over and he said, look, here's the problem. The problem is, is, is I'm attaching the screenshot to this ticket, and I'm putting it in JIRA, and the guy, and I sign it to him, and then he's not showing up with, in looking at the JIRA ticket, so he doesn't see it. And I said, 
<coughs> you sit five feet away from the guy. <laughs> why are you creating a jury tank? And why not forget your tool, forget your email, okay? Just go talk to people, collaborate. And one of the nice things about Scrum is it's going to provide these really nice collaboration. By the way, I know this is amazingly distracting, and I apologize for the animals, but it's sort of calming in a way, right? It's going in the background. Um, so what I wanted to do was something I've never tried before, which is really the, the lazy things of uh, PowerPoint. By the way, who here has ever used Pivotal Tracker? A few people in the back? Okay. So Pivotal Tracker is a company here at Pivotal, and they uh, do this Agile Tracker. And I haven't used it in several years, but um, I decided to actually do this entire uh, presentation using uh, Pivotal Tracker. And the reason is, is because I think in a lot of ways, Pivotal Tracker is a great tool. But as you're going to see uh, in my presentation, I'm going to show you how you can use even really great tools very, very poorly. So um, here, here's Pivotal Tracker. Okay. And we're going to start with the Old Testament here. And uh, this, is, this is our estimate of time that we're going to spend on. So we're going to treat this whole thing like it's a sprint. This is, this is going to be a sprint of a conversation that we're going to have. And uh, so uh, you know, here's our four points here. Understand it's an equation. Let's talk for a second about what we're supposed to be doing, building software. What's, why do you build software? <laughs> Solve business problems, exactly, to make money. Right? If you're going to make money, you have to consider these three things. You have to consider what's the overhead, which is me and you, the cost, the computers. But let's talk about inventory and three through, throughput. What's the throughput of software? Data. Data? Any other ones? What's the, what, what are you trying to actually spit out on a software product? Code. Code. Data, product. features, product. I'm getting closer now. Product. Because product is something you can sell, right? Understand this, and it's really important to understand this. And especially those of you who aren't developers, hopefully you'll get this. Um, code is inventory. Code is something I've got to sell. It's in fact, in a way, it's inventory that's stacked up. It's costing my company money. All right. Throughput in software development is code that people are willing to pay for. Right? And people are willing to use. So software has to do one of two things. It has to either make money or it has to save money. And that also encompasses marketing, right? Marketing is going to make money. So um, always be able to ask these questions about something that's being proposed within your company. If you can't fundamentally put a value on this product, on a product, then you should ask, as an engineer even, why am I doing this? I have a limited time on this planet. One time I was on a conference call at 10 in the morning, and this woman asked me to do, change something I'd already changed three times, and I said, I'm going to die. I'm going to die someday, and I don't want to spend my time talking. That was the end of her as a client, by the way. Don't ever bring up that on a conference call. Um, but, but you just have to think about these things in terms of, of actual meaning, and the meaning, once again, it's a business meaning of what, why we're engaged in this stuff. Um, another thing I'm going to talk about tonight is technical debt. Um, Technical debt happens all the time, but let me explain it very, very simply. Technical debt happens when you have an engineer or a planner or whatever who draws a box and he says, that's the server, and over here he says, that's the database, and then he draws an arrow. That arrow is technical debt, okay? All it is is somebody made something look really simple, all right? And as people who work with software, always learn to recognize what technical debt is, identify it, and eliminate it. And you eliminate it by actually solving the problem, by building it, by smoke testing, by actually building use cases of something. And generally, you do that even before you start the project. Or if it's in the middle of a project and you don't know what this is, maybe the best thing to do is, instead of trying to estimate it, is like break off part of your team and, and go research it. Go figure it out. All right. So um, I'm not going to actually mark any of these things down. I'm just going to fly through them here. Uh, so another thing that you're going to you should learn. You don't have to memorize these, but go through the 12 principles of agile. Spend a little time with these. Um, the ones that stick out to me. Uh, this one. They have to work daily throughout the project. What's interesting is, is that what I'm going to be talking about tonight mostly is Scrum, and actually it's not a daily iteration, right? It's, it's usually after every couple of weeks. But either way, like I think that, that tying in business people and getting them to own the product is really 
the, the ultimate value of this. Um, a lot of it is about working software. That's what we're trying to measure. We're not we're measuring your documentation. All if you hand somebody a, a 300 page piece of documentation, once again, it's just technical debt. It's just stuff that we you think that you solved the problem by writing all these requirements. You haven't. You just created problems for everybody. Um, sustainable development. This one is also key. I come back to this one all the time. That no matter what you recommend for people to do, if it's not sustainable, you should consider it maybe not the right choice, right? If it's always like if you're fighting fires, you're always going to push it out, you've got to keep going, keep going, people are just going to burn out and leave your, your company. So, you know, understand that people will respect you more if you provide developers space. And a lot of what Scrum is about is providing space and time for developers to do their work and to get involved in a flow. So, um, spend some time with these, think about them, and now I'm going to tell you about going raw, <coughs> the tool. So, what happened to me was, is uh, I got a funded company uh, about five years ago, six years ago, six years ago. Um, got two and a half million dollars. I mean, I thought I was, I thought I was a billionaire. <laughs> I was like, this is great, right? And then you realize two and a half million dollars is nothing when you're paying salaries. But I didn't know that at the time. We had a great product. We were bringing it to market, and uh, we wanted to just keep adding features. That's all that we thought we were supposed to do as engineers and engineers. So we just kept coming up with great ideas and implementing them. And as we were doing that, we had bugs, we had problems, but we weren't, we weren't worried about those. Let's just keep worrying about the features. We've got to innovate, we've got to get customers, we've got to ask in the seats. We had all the slang down. And what we didn't have down was a process. So along comes a consultant. And uh, this great guy, really smart guy, came into my business, and he said, um, Chaz, listen, man, agile. You gotta be agile. And I'm gonna give you the speech he gave me. And I was like, what's agile? He goes, you know, it's like moving. It's like he literally like, he like did a movement. And I'm like, well, okay, I can do that. You know, that's, that's the way we operate. We don't have a plan. Hey, we're already there. <laughs> you know, we're, we're agile. Um, and then he said to me, he said, well, yeah, but here's the deal. What you gotta do is use Pivotal Tracker. Because Pivotal Tracker is awesome. And I will actually say that Pivotal Tracker is awesome. Um, because it seems to do all of this stuff for you. What it does is, is it takes in your story points. Once you do estimations for your, for your tasks and your stories, and it creates a velocity for you. And it, then this velocity is applied automatically to <coughs> all the tasks you have. So you get these pre-built sprints. You're like, oh, well, this is what we can do in this amount of time. So it seems to be a perfect solution. So why am I bringing this up as a problem? Well, my brother Pete is a software engineer, and this is one of his quotes. He says it a lot. Uh, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And I was the fool. Um, that was actually an expression from uh, the, the 80s and 90s. You guys ever know what, you guys know what case tools are? <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah. <laughs> Anybody, like older guys, like case tools, yeah. So case tools, like rational rows, uh, came out of IBM. The idea was, we're just going to design databases, and then we're going to start, like, we're just into these relationships, and we're just going to spit out code. It's all going to be perfect, and no one's going to have to customize everything. Yeah, that didn't, didn't happen. Instead, we ended up with things like Rails and Rails and, and you know all these other frameworks that actually sort of do that for us, but allow us uh, to have a lot more flexibility and not be like in, locked into licensing agreements. Uh, but the point is, is he was talking about case tools, but I would say the same thing goes with any agile tool. Uh, be wary of Jira. Just because you've turned on Greenhopper does not mean you're using that, that you're using the right processes in your business. Okay? Don't ever make a choice. Because it's like, well, that's what the tool told me to do. You should instead be using the five whys on all of your choices. You should be talking to everyone involved in the software development process and the life cycle and figuring out and getting buy-in from everybody, from the top on down. So this tool guru came in, he sold me on this thing, and the next thing I know, we had tracking on all of our tickets, but like I said, we had all these bugs and we had all these things that we didn't want to get to. So suddenly we had a backlog what they call the ice box and pivotal, but we had a backlog of hundreds of tickets, right? How do you possibly decide what's important? This is really crucial, crucial for your PDMs out there. You guys own the backlog, and owning the backlog means protecting it from outer influences that haven't been vetted from a business interest. It means protecting it from your developers. 
and their choices about what the priority is. You ultimately have to own the entire product, and that means also not showing the developers your backlog. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, because if you show your developers a backlog, and they start working on a feature that might be tied into a future feature, they're going to start future-proofing. They're going to be going, eh, I decided to refactor this and add all these, you know, add all these parameters because I see that down the road they're going to have to do this or that. Here's a big secret that I, it took me a long time to learn. Play this game, and it is a game as I'm going to show you, like at the end of every two weeks, the plug could be pulled. At the end of every sprint, somebody could walk in and say, your funding's gone, and you're like, I don't care. I have a product, and it's viable. So you've got to play it that way. If you don't play it that way, then you shouldn't be playing this. You're better off with Waterfall. You really are. So you have to be delivering real product every <laughs> sprint cycle. So um, one of the things that this taught me, having this endless backlog, and then my company basically went out of business. Still, it still exists, but um, I don't work for it. Um, <laughs> What did I learn? Well, I learned that, that we weren't asking the right questions. The engineers weren't, right? <coughs> the engineers have, even though they can't tell you what the priority of the backlog should be, engineers have valuable opinions about what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And that, in listening to those people and providing a forum for them, which is the, the retrospective, right, and also the sprint planning, like, that's really important because you want everybody to have this sense of a team you know, they're working together as a team. And I can't even tell you how many developers I've talked to, and I, and I just won the other day, and I said to him, look, you don't get to say what happens, but your opinion matters. And that is that moment when they go, oh, I, I'm valued here. I'm not gonna leave this company to go work for a startup that, that might make me a billionaire. I'm just gonna stay here and, and figure out ways to make the product better. Uh, another thing that, uh, that none, of, none of this will do for you, all these tools, they won't actually provide the roles. And now I'm going to get into Scrum, and I'm going to talk about what the roles are and why it's so important. So, um, everybody here knows what Scrum is. If you don't, everybody's going to give me like yes or no. How many people know what Scrum is or think they would be able to define Scrum? Okay. So, Scrum is a uh, <coughs> process for organizing small teams of people. Um, it's been defined often as empirical process control. So the idea is, is that you're going to figure out you know, how Scrum works and you're going to improve it over time by augmenting the rules of Scrum. It's like a mini democracy, right? That's sort of the way our, 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 our country and our constitution was created. Um, Scrum is, to me, when Agile stopped being a religion and started being something like a science. It started being something that actually I could, I could tweak and figure out what works in particular situations. Um, some great books on, uh, on Scrum and Agile that have been written by uh, Ken, Ken Schwabler and uh, other guys. Like there's a whole bunch of them out there. Jack Sullivan. Uh, yeah, Jeff Sullivan. Um, so the things that you're going to have to do and get buy-in from to actually make Scrum work are right here. So you're going to have to follow uh, these rules of these Scrum events. And these are just the meetings that are happening. Um, and these meetings are going to happen in a particular cadence, and they have to happen in that cadence. Stand-ups always have to happen at the same time. No exceptions. Sprints start and end at predefined times. No exceptions. <coughs> if you don't respect that, don't do Scrum. Don't do Agile. And this was the big secret that occurred to me. Agile, this thing about movement, I'm really fast and responsive, it's like saying, I'm fast and responsive as a karate master, right? You have all of this rigor that you've developed over time in your movements, and that's why you can be agile and, and, and full of motion. You can't do it without that rigor. So if you can't follow event rules and you can't political buy it work, it's not going to work. Um, we already talked about tracking money. Second thing that's important is track velocity. <coughs> velocity is a determination of the difficulty of certain tasks or stories. In other words, don't task, don't track how long it takes somebody to do something. Don't ask them how long. Because if you ask an engineer, how long is it going to take to do that? He's going to lie to you. I would lie to you because I don't know. And the problem is then, then people think, well, okay, um, you said three hours, and then, well, how long did it take? What are they going to say? Three hours. Because then they look like a genius. And recognize this. If you're tracking hours right now, I'm going to convince you to stop right now. And here's how. If, let's say that all the hours weren't why, 
clients. Let's say they were all completely legitimate, and you said, oh, you know what, how long is it going to take you? You say, it's a half hour. Okay, and how long did it take you? It's a half hour. And we get it perfectly timed so you know how long these things are taking. What do we have? All we have is a system that allows us to have full capacity utilization. Is everybody stacked up with full work all the time, which number one, is not sustainable, right? People need to breathe, people need to have space to think and to innovate. And number two, is not the goal of your business. Your business goal should be to make money. It is not capacity utilization. Um, and there's a great book called The Goal, which is all about this. I highly recommend everybody read it. Um, so another thing, if you're not able to get political buy-in on this, you're going to have real problems with getting struck to work. Failed sprints are disgraceful. Why is it disgraceful? Because a sprint is about asking engineers to assess how long it's going to take to get something done. And if I, not, I'm sorry, not well how long, but rather, what can you do within a particular time box, right? So I say, figure out how difficult these things are, do estimations, do planning poker, and now you're gonna accept all of these, these, these tasks right? as a team. Now if I give you a chance to do that, and after two or three iterations, you're failing, something is really wrong, right? Either you are way overestimating, there's a technology problem, there's a process problem, there's a people problem, you don't fucking know how to code, <laughs> there's something wrong here. And if you can't identify what's wrong, then there's something wrong with you as somebody who's, who's advocating that, hey, I know what's going on with Agile, I can, I can, make, I can grease these rails. Um, the board, the Kanban board, the Scrum board, um, you need, or, or JIRA, whatever that board is, that is the thing. That is canon, okay? In other words, if you have a stand-up and somebody's just standing up and just talking about like, oh yeah, you know, I woke up this morning and I don't know, coded a little bit, and maybe in the afternoon I'll write some tests, it's like, that's not a stand-up. A stand-up is about individual tasks as you pull off the board and say, who's doing this, okay? And let me explain another reason I could go on for hours about like why I like physical boards, but, um, when somebody, when you have a bunch of tasks in your, your you know, column, your to-do column, and somebody picks one off and says, okay, who's, who's doing this? And it's, it's Joel, Joel goes, oh, okay, I'll, I'm doing, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do here today on this. Um, you might also say, at that moment, I don't have time to do this today, or I don't understand what I'm doing. And then you say, oh, well, let me help you out. Those are the magic moments. That's when you have a team developing code. And the way I always phrase it with my developers is, there's a guy in Queens, who lives in Queens, who can do everything that you do, and he does it at one-tenth the cost. So why am I not talking to that guy in Queens? It's because I paid all this money, have all these desks, to get all of you guys together, so you guys could work together, and you guys could be a force multiplier for, for coding together. So social coding, the advantages of it only happen if you can get that team spirit going in. And there's a couple ways of tricks I'm going to show you how to do it. Uh, rules can change in Scrum, and there's no such thing as scope creep. Take it out of your language, okay? <laughs> because scope creep suggests that there's such a thing as a scope. There's not a scope. What there is, is continual improvement that we want to try to make. And there are things that should be in the backlog, and there should things that shouldn't be. And the scope of that within Scrum and within iterative software development is something that is always going to change. And the moment you tell somebody, it's like, ah, that was out of the scope of the work, then you've got a problem. I think that, that how many people here actually work with paying clients? It's like not a bigger business, but it's like people come to you and pay. So, okay, so about half the people here. Um, this is an entirely different conversation I can give, but you've got to sell Agile from the very first meeting to them. Okay, you've got to go in and you've got to explain that I'm not selling you a product. You're buying my time and my time is valuable and my team's time is valuable and we are going to deliver this iterative product. And I, you have all your requirements and great, you can say, look, we're going to try to get to them and we're going to find out, we're going to find out together. There's going to be ultimate transparency. But you've got to keep your salespeople from saying, oh yeah, August 15th, we'll get it all done. It's not what it's about. Like in the moment they've done that, they've broken everything here. Um, so you you have to sell that up the line. Um, okay, now let's talk about Scrum. Uh, sorry, the board. So uh, you guys ever read the book Rules of Play? Anybody ever read that book? It's a great, great book. 
uh, written by an NYU professor. Um, and he talks about game theory and about gaming. Um, and in it, he has this great idea. And the idea is, is the magic circle. Like, what makes a game a game? And the way you think about it is, is, is there's a game board, right? And inside this circle, this is our special space. You know, I'm going to be a knight and you're going to be a princess, right? We're going to play a game called Scrum. Now, what's our circle? What's our magic circle in Sprint or in Scrum, in Agile? Anybody? What would you say it is? There we go. It's our sprint. It's our sprint. It's our time. It's our time box. Now, just really shortly, um, everybody sort of starts the default position of sprints being two weeks. I agree with that. I think a fortnight, if you will, is a great measure of, of people. They get into a cadence, a cycle, um, and it gives time, a little bit of breathing time. If you have problems with projects, don't increase the time. Never increase the time of your sprints. Always go to a week. If you're having a problem in this magic circle, making it bigger is not going to solve any problems. So go to a like, week-long sprints. You might want to go to three-day-long sprints. It doesn't, no, Scrum doesn't say anything about how long a sprint should be. Um, and, and I think that different projects, like if we were on a, like let's say it's a hackathon right now, we, wouldn't, we would have maybe like five-hour sprints, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a weekend sprint. Um, so, uh, finding a rhythm and adjusting to improvement is what it's about. Uh, respect the sprint. Don't ever change a sprint timeline. If the sprint fails, it fails. And people understand that word fail. They understand what failure is. It sucks to fail in things, especially type A personalities. That you will get amazing uh, performance increases out of people when, as a team, they succeed. Failing sucks. But succeeding means developers come and high five each other, and they sit around in the retro and talk about what a great job they did. And trust me, that's another one of those magic moments. So we're going to pick our time cycle in sprints. Uh, in our sprint planning for the PDMs, you guys own that product. You come into that meeting with your sprint goals and knowing what it is that you want to do in that sprint. Now, you might not get it. It's up to the team to accept whether they're going to do those tasks or not. But you come in and you fight for it. That's important for the, that's, by the way, a lot of this thing, is, it's like Dungeons and Dragons. Here, anybody play Dungeons and Dragons here? Wow, really dorky guys in the back. Uh, it, this is a, it's a fantasy thing, but we have roles and, and we have to play them. So we're going to get to the roles in a second. Uh, so treat daily st um, stand-ups. Uh, like they are very intense huddles, like a football huddle, okay? Um, you need to have a scrum master, okay? He's like a quarterback in the sense that actually he's not calling plays. He's just sort of taking in the plays and figuring out who's going to go to But the scrum master should be running your, your daily stand-ups. Don't let people sit down with their computers open. This stuff matters. Go and take it off of your feet. Why do you stand up in a, a stand-up? Anybody? Cause, yes, because standing up should sucks, right? It's like I'm, I've been standing for like 30 minutes now. And I'm like, this sucks. I really want to uh, But no, it makes you go fast, right? It, it, it really works. Uh, leave the devs alone. Don't schedule meetings. It's, it is not the job of developers to go and talk in your meetings, convince you that the project is on task. Okay? There are events for that. If you want to change the process, there's a retrospective at the end. Go to the retrospective. Get your notes together. You know, as PDM, I believe that you should never interrupt a, uh, a product development flow. Um, a really important one everybody seems to miss, when you are doing your, your sprint uh, reviews, right? when you're showing your product to your stakeholders, don't show them the product. This is a sales pitch. It's a sales meeting. right? You, you should, in, if you're selling something to someone, you, you hand it to them. Right? You say, try this out. Like, go to the Apple store. Right? They, you know, they, they don't just say, let me show you this. Like, they, they say, why don't you try this out? And yet it's amazing. I've just been so many product demos where it's a developer or the PDM or the PO or whatever going, oh, let me, now let's do this next little thing. And don't do it. The moment someone touches what you've made, they are part owner of that. And it matters to them. Okay? 
okay? This is once again about that mattering. It's about meaning. It's about them owning it and paying enough attention. Um, and the spread pressure, I've already mentioned it, make sure that you're doing, getting that feedback that's going on. Um, now, let's talk about uh, rules. This is, this is was my magic moment when I realized that um, you know, Agile only really works with some kind of rules. It doesn't have to be Scrum, by the way. You could use Lean or, or Extreme Programming or Kanban. If you don't like rules, go Kanban, right? <laughs> there's, there's all kinds of ways to make this Agile work, but don't kid yourself. This is about rules, and if you're not willing to be the person to make them and enforce them, don't do it or find that person. Um, fundamentally, those rules are going to be enforced by the development team on the development side, but only if it all works from the product manager side and the, and the stakeholder side. The stakeholder is actually the only person that you don't really have to worry about because you're going to be telling him how, or her how they're supposed to act. Okay. Um, if if you guys are stakeholders and you are going to bring agile into our organization, um, that probably I haven't seen that happen really, but uh, that probably is also something that you're going to have to get a lot of buy-in down the road from. But um, you know, generally, it's people you know, internally in the organization saying, hey, we're not doing something right here. We want to improve it. Um, this is a political solution. Once again, this is why the tools don't work just on their own. Like Pivotal is great. Jira, you know, fog bugs, like whatever. Name, name 50 different agile tools. They all can be used right. But recognize if you don't have the political buy-in, it's not going to work. And everything has to be about cooperative development. It's about getting the advantages that you see in open source software projects every day. So now I'm going to uh, talk really quickly about the rules. Some of the stuff, I'm, I apologize if I'm repetitive. I'm a repetitive guy. Uh, rules matter. Points matter. Um, who here does points estimation for their stories? OK. And how many people do hours estimation? Just, OK, we have a couple hours. Um, I use. Uh, I've used several different point systems. Pivotal actually uh, uses by default. They just have numbers here. But one of the nice things about uh, Pivotal is you can actually make this any sequence of numbers you want. I prefer the Fibonacci sequence um, because it, it gets it gets people to think in terms of right, you know, hey, how quickly is this going to expand? And it also um, one question that's always going to come up from an engineer when you try to use points. They're going to say, okay, well, what does that mean in terms of time? And the interesting thing is, is that if you use planning code then that number will start to have meaning in terms of time, but over time. In other words, you don't stand, you don't stand up before the first planning poker session and say, oh, by the way, a 13 means four days. But I guarantee you that after engineers have been using planning poker for like four or five you know, sprints, that a five is going to mean a day you know, or something in that realm. It doesn't necessarily mean a day. It might be different for each team, but that team will be very specific. And another thing i got to say about points, Points don't have meaning. Velocity doesn't have meaning across teams. Okay, that, that that has to be one of the rules of the game because otherwise engineers will not want to do this because they're going to be tagging their development, their personal career to at some point, and they're like, wait a second, you know, I, what am I worth? Forty points? Like, what does that mean? Instead, you want to explain to them like this is about optimizing for you guys, so we can figure out how much you can do and we can plot a burn down and then explain to them. This is about also us helping you figure out if you need more resources. Like if you can't hit these goals, then maybe we can figure out something else, a way to, to remove the, the obstacles, to remove the, the bottlenecks. Um, Failing you? sprints matter, I, I told, told you guys, <coughs> roles matter most of all. Um, so I'm calling these guys the suit, the sweater, the t-shirt, and the capital t-shirt. Yes? My question, do you, do you have a rule what story should be coined, what story should be not? Be, should not be point like spike. Normally, people don't recommend you point size a spike because it's just. Yeah. So here's what I would say is that um, the important thing is to be consistent, but not even necessarily within your own company. It's just about the team. Like, in fact, in my new company, to you, we've got one team that is just doing story points for just the stories, meaning not tasks or anything. Just like you know, as a user, I want to log in, right? That's and they'll be like, that's whatever seven points, or whatever. Um, and then that there's another project where they're actually doing it per task. And so their velocities are going to be wildly different. But it doesn't matter because it's only important within a particular team, within a siloed team. So I would say that as long as whatever the team decides on is totally fine. Just get them to buy in on it. 
Like you don't want this to be them thinking. And by the way, if in a retro they come and they say, hey, we don't like that points are only stories, we want them to be tasks, we'll let them do it. Like they, they by consensus, I mean you can vote, you can roll dice, you can do whatever you want to, but we want them to have buy-in into the process. So it's it's up to them. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention about this, because uh, I, I talked about it a little bit, and it's totally unfair because there are definitely you know, PMs that wear t-shirts, and there are developers that wear dress shirts every day. Uh, but this is more just like uh, you know thinking about what is an acceptable dress. Um, notice that the Scrum Master is the developer. Okay, this this is a, a problem I've seen. People seem to think Scrum Master is a is a job. It's not. It shouldn't be because the only thing that a developer is going to respect, and I tell you this as a developer, is another developer's opinion. Like, I don't, you know, if, if I have a bunch of JavaScript and you came along and you said, you know, you should have been able to do that in four hours, and I'm going to be like, where's your GitHub repo? Like, how much scripting have you done? Um, but in other developers, we do respect each other's opinions, and we do take peer analysis very seriously. So you need your Scrum Master, that person who's going to be running these meetings, to be one of them. I don't know if that's something that's controversial or not, but I, I just see that's one thing I've seen uh, incorrectly done. Okay, so let me talk about something else that went wrong in a different company that I was a CTO of. And uh, I guess we can, you guys can read this. So here's my tasks. We've got so much to do, so many bugs. What do we do? Yeah, I know, man. I mean, how does it happen if people make so many tickets for things to be removed all together? Maybe these tools we use can be used incorrectly. Do your ticket worth So. What does this represent? This represents a typical backlog if you're just using a tool and you're just getting bug reports and they're just sitting there. Don't let it happen. You are better off hiring somebody on Mechanical Turk to take phone calls, to write down tickets by hand, than giving somebody access to JIRA. Okay? Because that person who has access to JIRA, one of the things they can do is they can go in and they can reorder your tickets and they can hit up and prioritize it. And what does everybody think in the entire world? I keep trying to tell my wife this. Everybody cares about themselves. Like that's the way we frame the universe. So of course your ticket is, is the most important. Um, I think that the biggest problem with this sort of backlog losing control of it is the word ticket. If you use the word ticket in your organization, I would recommend trying to move away from it, okay? And the reason is, is because a ticket is just a meaningless word. It's just a thing, right? You might as well just call it, you know, thingy. Look at my thingy, right? Don't, don't look at me. Uh, but, the, you know, it, it, like a feature means something. A bug means something. An enhancement. There's a million words we can use to describe the things we want. And a ticket is something that nobody respects, everybody hates it, there's really no value in closing a ticket, but if I told you, hey, by the way, you just brought a feature online, you're going to be like, hey, that was, that was cool, I like that. Um, so what happened anyhow in this, I just sort of show you that. Um, we had so many backlogs, uh, tickets in this one project uh, that it was just absolutely impossible. This was really more the first story, but uh, and I guess it happened at this one too. Um, we let the backlog be controlled by our business guys. So our business guys came in and started to just make tickets on things that they wanted. So then you had a mix up of like, it was their opinions versus bugs versus stories. And once again, it's just when you, when you let go of that control of that, um, you're not gonna be able to, to be agile. All right, uh, how are we doing on time? Am I boring you guys? It's good stuff? Okay, I, I don't know, I mean, I'm sorry, it's, it's not, you know, I don't do this all the time. Um, so I want to talk about plus one uh, which is, I think, a really beautiful thing. Um, so who here uses GitHub for their projects? How many we got? Just a few? Just started. Okay, just started. GitHub is supported. Okay, good. GitHub is subversion. Great idea. Uh, as, as one of my developers once said to me, subversion is your grandfather's repo. And I said, what are you talking about? There are no repositories my grandfather's around. Um, yeah. So you don't have to, to to use GitHub to understand what I'm about to say here, but I'm just going to explain a process that you can use using GitHub that, that's very, very useful. Um, so this is outside the bounds of Scrum and Agile, 
uh, but it's but it speaks very much to their process. And the, the process is pull requests <coughs> and plus one angle. Okay. So does how many people here have companies where they do code reviews? Be serious. You have actual code reviews. One. That is okay. Two. Okay. So that is probably honest. Very, very few companies do code reviews. You know why? Because it's a total waste of time, at least from the perspective of most engineers, most product managers. They're like, listen, I, I don't have time. I got to do all these tickets. So <laughs> please let me do it. Um, what this is going to let you do, if you use a system like this, is it's going to let you do continuous code review. Okay. And so what it is is, you can think about it in the, the, the Kanban board world here. So this is actually a control group. This is the, the way their board works. And um, they've got their backlog over here. Let's call it. It's using out on the board. So we got to do. We got in progress. We got plus one. We've got uh, QC, quality control, or QA, however you want to call it. And then we've got uh, shippable. And I'm going to tell you a couple reasons I really love this board. Um, so after things are in progress, then it goes to plus one. And what that means is, is somebody goes into GitHub, and they hit a little button that says pull request. And what a pull request does is it sends out an email to everybody on the team that says, hey, could someone come take a look at my code? And what does it mean to look at the code? It means you have to read it. Someone has to understand it. All right? That doesn't mean you have to refactor it. It doesn't mean you have to comment on it. At the very least, all it means is that you read it. And now, but what does that mean? Well, when I read someone else's code, I basically, by reading it, I'm, I'm part and parcel of it. Like, I'm involved with him and his code now. I have an opinion on it. And that opinion is plus one, generally. That means I looked at it. I just type plus one, and when you see that plus one, then the quality control people go, oh, look, I'm going to pick up that ticket, I'm going to pick up that feature, and I'm going to look at that feature, and, and either I'm going to reject it and send it back to in progress, or I'm going to say, oh, yeah, you know what, we got something that's shippable. So that, what's really cool about plus one is this is the way open source software is done, and this is the reason that you know, systems like Linux are so powerful and amazing, it's because you have a community of people that are willing to plus one each other. But recognize that amongst your developers right now, they would love to be plus one each other. They just don't have the time. Because they think it's like it's all about like some code review where we have to sit in a room for three hours and go through everybody's repos. It's not about that. It's about every single committed piece of code should be looked at by somebody else in your organization. It's an incredibly valuable way to not only get buy-in from everybody in your organization, but rather to catch security flaws, to catch performance problems, and you know potentially to, to, to allow a pathway for better communication between your programmers. And that's what it's about. Uh, once again, the slideshow of the vanities. I guess those are vanities. Um, let's get the bear right back on. Okay, so any questions about pull requests and plus one? I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but um, if you go and take a look, here's what I recommend for further research, is go uh, Google GitHub Flow. <clears throat> this is the way that GitHub, the actual company, uses uh, their own system of pull requests to create software. And recognize that, you know, before you stare at that, say, well, why do I care about GitHub? GitHub does continuous deployment. Okay? Continuous deployment is the holy grail. That's the hardest thing you can do in software development. So, you know, clearly it works for them and it lets them push through code that you know is in the 99th Six Sigma percentile. You've heard so, about this versus Paramore. Oh, you know what? Good question. Uh, I the way I consider it is, if you're pair programming, you are plus one. So, so that that's what that is. Like you know and. Pair programming, um, I have nothing but really good things to say about it, except I wouldn't, I wouldn't say by default you should be pairing. If there's, if these are boring tasks, like just like sort of, this is crap you just have to do, uh, then maybe it's better for people to split up into double your force. But if it's anything non-trivial, then you probably should be pairing. You should be sitting down and working through it together. Yeah. Of course, uh, between dev complete and QC, QC, OK, whatever you want to call that state, 
uh, oftentimes there is a buffer state called dev complete or QA ready. Mm -hmm. Would you equate that to that plus one or is it some flavor? No, because it's, it, here's the thing, by plus one, we're not asking a developer to actually run the product and test it. That's QC's job. We're looking, we're saying look at the code. So you just ask for one more opinion. I'm sorry? It's one more opinion that you're asking for. It's one more opinion. One of the things, I mean, you can set up whatever requirements you want, plus one, like one of the things we look for is tests, right? You have like unit tests. You know, now QC is never going to look for your unit tests. I mean, they might you might run against Jenkins and see whether they fail or whatever. But like you you need someone to actually go and check and see if somebody has been you know misusing arrays or you know just like totally programming on your ass or or potentially stolen copyrightable code. I mean, there's a million reasons why plus one is is not only going to identify this process but it's help prevent it. Yeah, right. Crappy unit tests like this is, is this a unit test? Yes. Right. No, nobody's. That's the worst kind of unit test, right? Um, okay. So I'm, I'm going to try to wrap up in the next couple of minutes here, guys. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. Um, another thing that can go wrong is the setting. Now, I'm not going to name names here, but um, if you have somebody who asks, "Do I have to stand up at stand-ups?" That is a huge red flag. Okay, and recognize it as such. Like people that show cynicism and eye rolling about this process in this game, they are your mortal enemy. Okay, and you have to identify them. You have to pull them aside. It's like when you're working with like six-year-olds at a soccer game. Sometimes as a kid who sits down in the middle of the field, you can't let that happen because soon everyone will be sitting in the middle of the field. You go pick them up. Okay, and uh, it, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, fire them. But if somebody you know really can't get on board, and somebody you know is a is a crappy scrum master, and they just don't want to do it, and it's just like oh this is you know this is lame these meetings and all I just want to code, you have to be able to convince them that there is a huge advantage in social coding. And if you can't, get rid of them because there's a million programmers that need jobs, and no, I'm not paying not billion, but <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of assets that you can move in to organizations and you can train properly. Um, failed spread, that's a bad one. Um, honors, at the same time, you have to honor a sustained development pace that you can't ask of people to stay uh, to midnight every night. Um, it's a terrible problem with startups is thinking that people are for, for yeah, for their 20,000 shares, that they're supposed to be there till 1 a.m. every night. Um, it's not only, the, the biggest problem to me is it sort of violates this, this sense of like, what are we trying to make shippable? We're trying to make the best quality thing shippable. And there's no company that ever got, uh, you know, uh, acquired for a billion dollars that had a bunch of buggy code. Okay, I'm gonna take that back. <laughs> um, so yeah, this once again, for the guy who complains, uh, you know, I, I've even written job recommendations for guys who didn't like Scrum, didn't like Sprints, um, and didn't, didn't like the process at all. Be good for them. It, it's not it's not a personal thing, but maybe they're just not right for this kind of team software building. Um, another thing I want to talk about, one other problem, uh, is integration. So a lot of times you're going to have projects where you have to do a deployment on a system you've never seen before, and you know, or if you're integrating with some API that you don't know anything about. Let me suggest that, that Agile and Scrum are maybe not the way to solve your problems. In other words, even asking someone to estimate via planning poker, so you're getting everybody's estimation and you're, you know, you're figuring out what it is, something that no one has ever done before is sort of pointless. It'd be better to have just spent the time for someone to actually try to do it. So this is why I think Sprint Zero is so important. Start a project in Make this into your client sales time if you're doing something non-trivial that's never been done before, where you're actually smoke testing. And I think I think of it as I always call it like pushing pixels. You take one pixel, you're pushing it to your deployment environment. Okay? Not a test or rather, but rather this is actually where we're gonna go. Alright? And then you're gonna have solved all of those problems. Because go back to here. Like this is what you want to avoid. And too many projects, you start out with that diagram with those arrows. Ask your, always ask why is that error there? What is that? You said the word API, that's not magic. Like, what is the endpoint? What am I feeding into there? Feed it in there. 
tell the developer, it's like, why don't you just hit it and let's see what comes back. Oh, this is a JSON, all right, let's see how we're gonna parse it. Like, you can solve these things in real time with the tool sets that we have these days, and it's not worth selling yourself in with all this technical debt by trying to estimate something that, that you know, honestly, you just don't know. So be very careful. Um, Start with the research stuff, Spike. Uh, and I already talked about it. Okay, so uh, I think I'll just wrap it up and say that um, you know there's other you can you can blog uh, or you can look up some of my blog entries about uh, about agile development um, and I've talked a lot about how you sell it and in particular there's uh, something about it's called halting problem. Um, you guys know what the halting problem is. Um, so there's a a computer science problem which is this. And if I were to run, and Alan Turing, actually a uh, famous computer scientist, first one, uh, actually came up with this. And he said, look, if I run a program, there's no way for me to know when it's going to stop. Right? I just don't know. It's impossible because there could be a loop that's going on in the program, right? And I'd have to wait. And I'd have to wait forever. And there's no way by, without running the code to figure out if something is going to halt or not. That's the halting problem. Agile software development is, and it, it addresses specifically the halting problem, right? In, the other, in other words, think about the actual product development cycle as a computer program. We don't really know when it's going to halt. We might be working on something that turns into Facebook, right? That's got a, 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 a life cycle of 20 years. We might be working on something that gets the plug pulled on in two weeks. So we have to act as if the halting problem will never be solved. 20,000 years from now, the halting problem will still exist. You're still not going to know if the software, the piece of software is going to end or not. Same thing as goes with project management. You're really not going to know how the marketplace is going to respond to it. You're not going to know if your developer is going to quit or if his mom's going to die and he's going to have to move out of town. You don't know any of this stuff. So this is a way uh, to do what the Marines call respond to chaos. Like The idea is not to be rigid from the top down in terms of your knowing exactly what you're going to do, but it is instead to be rigid in the way you're going to react as a team to any kind of, of situational change. And that's what, for my money, Agile's about, and that was like, you know, how I went from a guy who didn't know how to use Agile to a guy that now is speaking in front of all you wonderful people. Thank you.